Hello, my studio teacher friends. Welcome to the Beyond Measure podcast. Christina Whitlock here, your self-appointed anytime piano teacher friend. This show is designed to offer teachers like you a dose of camaraderie from someone who understands your work experience. (laughs) If you are interested in even more community from fellow teachers, I invite you to join my Patreon community. Once a month, some of us gather on Zoom and work through a specific piece of repertoire together. We talk about the pedagogical opportunities of the piece, challenges, musical opportunities, all the good stuff. I call this meetup Teachers Teaching Teachers, and it is seriously a highlight of my month. I'm telling you all this today because our next session of TTT is taking place this Friday, March 29th. You can get in on the fun for just $6. It's absolutely the most affordable professional development out there. The community would love to see you there on Friday. Just head to christinawhitlock.com slash Patreon or check out the link in today's show notes for details. And now, without further delay, let's get on with the show. You are listening to episode 162 of the Beyond Measure podcast, Cheers to stating the obvious. Today we are talking about stating the obvious. But if you look at the title of this episode, you will note that I have placed quotation marks around the word obvious. My point being, things that are obvious to us as teachers are... (laughs) Well, not always obvious to our students. Because we cannot read our students' minds, it's really important that we take special care to say all of the necessary things. And furthermore, that we say them in the right order. Presenting ideas in the right order is a key component of good teaching that we don't spend enough time talking about. I suppose that needs to be its own episode, but today we're talking about stating the obvious in quotations. (laughs) I'm going to tell you a story that might feel a little random at first, okay? Hang with me here. (laughs) When I was a teenager preparing to get my driver's license, there were at that time two parts to the driving test. One was the road test, which obviously involved driving an examiner around town, following his instructions to turn left here, etc. The other part of the driving test was called maneuverability, and this portion of the test involved a specific maneuver you needed to complete with your vehicle involving five orange safety cones. Now, my driver's ed teacher was very experienced at teaching students to complete this drill. So the first time we tried it, she told me exactly how to do it, how to set the cones up to practice, where to stop the car, where to turn the wheel a quarter of a turn, when to put the car in reverse, how to feel the wheel spin back a full circle and a half under my hands. I mean, you get the point. She gave me every step. And it seemed like she just handed the solution to me on a silver platter. But guess who had a really hard time with that maneuver? (laughs) Yep. In fact, I can't believe I'm admitting this on air, but I failed that portion of the test twice. (laughs) Remember last week when I told you that I count humility as a core value of mine? (laughs) Well, here I am just trying to keep it real. So I finally passed that portion of my driver's test on the third try. But here's where it gets interesting. (laughs) I was celebrating with my friends and I made the comment, 
man, I'm just glad we didn't have to like parallel park. I would have never passed that exam <laughs> because after all, I had seen many television shows and movies where teen drivers and parallel parking had proven to be an unsuccessful pairing. <laughs> To this day, I can still see the look on my friends' faces when I made that comment. Like they were really confused. And eventually someone said, uh, you did have to parallel park. <laughs> That's what you were doing. And then it all made sense. <laughs> All of those months of practicing this drill, all of those quarter, half, and whole turns of the steering wheel and looking for the safety cone to be at the midpoint of my passenger side window, like all of the things, friends, and I never had one single clue what I was actually simulating with that maneuver. <laughs> the cones represented other cars. Oh, <laughs> Now, you are probably sitting there wondering how I could possibly miss something so obvious. And I mean, I still wonder that to this day. But the truth of the matter is, I had an instructor, two parents, and an older brother, all of whom helped me at different points with this drill. And none of them ever actually stated what I was trying to accomplish. Do you know how much easier it would have been to figure out that maneuver if I had actually realized the goal? <laughs> like, I literally thought it was just a sequence of turns and the like. I'd completely missed the point. Now, I am sharing this less than shining moment in my life with you because we have all been the instructor in this situation. <laughs> Maybe not guiding students behind the driver's wheel, but definitely guiding them around their instrument. Let me give you an example from piano teacher world, okay? Let's think about how we teach pedaling. It's very easy to jump straight into the mechanics and the timing and the technical intricacies of how to pedal properly at the piano. But please, my friends, we must state that which is obvious to us. We must start with the sound. We have to explain why we're going to use the pedal in this instance. Is it to create a bell-like effect? Is it to maintain a consistency of sound? Like what is the actual point? I promise you, again, we are all guilty of this in one way or another. We miss opportunities to state the obvious. And some of our students are comfortable enough or intuitive enough to catch on regardless. Like there are many students who came out of that same driver's education experience, understanding the fact that they were learning to parallel park. <laughs> but I am a fairly intelligent person and I still somehow missed that one. As a professional musician, we have worked so deep into the intricacies of our instrument for so long, it's really easy to get sucked into a trap where we are neglecting to say the most basic essentials. Okay, since I'm on a roll here, let me tell you another driving related story. <laughs> This past fall, I was booked to speak to a group of music teachers in Indianapolis. So I left my house with plenty of time to spare, but I ended up getting stuck in some traffic for quite some time. Now I had the address of the meeting location in my GPS, but I had made the unfortunate mistake of not actually looking up what area of Indianapolis I was heading to. So after the standstill traffic finally got moving and I was back on track for an on-time arrival, I ended up missing an exit Ugh. in construction traffic. And so began a very harrowing series of wrong turns and missed exits and, oh man, it was bad. 
<laughs> I should also tell you that I get terrible anxiety on the highway. So I was just an absolute mess. I ended up being really, really late to that presentation. And I felt so badly about it. The group was amazingly gracious to me. But the reason I'm telling you this story is had I taken the time to figure out the area of Indianapolis I was actually heading to, I could have used my own brain to help figure out how to get there despite my wrong turns and mixed, missed exits. Instead, I was just stuck relying on the GPS and the construction signs and all of these things that can be very helpful, sure, but they were just showing me steps and not the end result. So the takeaway here is actually not that I am a terrible driver. <laughs> I assure you, I can indeed parallel park and I can indeed successfully drive to locations in Indianapolis. <laughs> but as it turns out, I do need to know the obvious yet sometimes overlooked details of what I'm actually doing. And I'm quite sure that you have students who are in the same boat. So when we're talking to them for the umpteenth time about the shape of their fingers or the tension they're carrying in their shoulders, let's make sure that we explain why these things are an issue. See, our beginner students often don't care about supported fingertips because they can play their beginner pieces without them. We have to tell them, look, I know this probably doesn't seem like a big deal right now, but there is going to come a time when you won't be able to play your music with those floppy fingers. <laughs> it's going to be so much harder to fix them then, so I really want to build them correctly now. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Let's try it again. We prescribe all these practice techniques to our students, right? But do they know why they are doing them? Because if your student doesn't know why you are asking them to change articulations or practice on alternate rhythms, they are not going to do that at home. And even if by some miracle they do, they are probably not doing it effectively because they don't understand the objective. I believe one of the primary shortcomings of teachers and students is failing to name our objective. I have a whole episode dedicated to that idea. It's episode 45. Cheers to naming your objective. There's another episode shortly thereafter. It's number 62. It's called Cheers to Not Missing the Point. And that also feels relevant to this conversation. So I'm going to link both of those episodes in today's show notes for you to check out just in case any of this is really resonating with you. I've got one more story before we wrap up today. And no, this is not about driving. <laughs> when I was in the hospital after giving birth to my first daughter, I had the best nurses I could have imagined. I mean, they were seriously so great. I feel forever indebted to them. But for some reason, I kept waiting on them to give me permission to take a shower. <laughs> there is uh, a lot of aftercare post childbirth. So they had walked me through all kinds of do's and don'ts. And I just assumed that I must not be allowed to take a shower yet. So it was customary at that time to stay 48 hours in the hospital post-birth. So for almost two days, I did not take a shower. <laughs> that is gross, people. Uh, finally, just a few hours before I was to be released, I finally asked one of my nurses if I could just take a shower. And she looked at me and she was like, of course you can. <laughs> And wow, did I make a beeline for that shower as fast as I could. <laughs> then the nurses were so funny as they came to see me after I'd showered and changed my clothes and all the things. <laughs> they were like, wow, you look so good. 
So the whole time they were probably wondering why this disgusting lady wasn't taking a shower when it turned out I was waiting on their permission. Now, psychoanalyze me all you want, but again, I want to tell you that you have students who are waiting for permission from you for all kinds of things that you don't realize. You have students who don't think their practice time counts if they're playing older pieces, or students who think they have to come to you and ask for sheet music for the song they heard on the radio, rather than just sitting down and trying to sound some of it out. You have students who think those YouTube tutorials are completely off limits to them, who want to branch out their repertoire, but they're waiting on some kind of permission slip from you first, whatever the case may be. Now, I know I've told a lot of embarrassing stories today, but seriously, friends, I hope today's episode serves as a solid reminder to state the obvious in your lessons, <laughs> relentlessly name your objectives, and know that some of your students are waiting for your permission to do the thing that seems obvious to you. So while you think about those things, let's wrap up with a toast. Studio music teacher friends from all around the world. <sighs> Ours is a job of leaving no stone unturned. Great teachers are those who say everything that needs said in as few words as possible. <laughs> Go figure that one. May we be aware of those traps that we can fall into where we tell our students all the steps but we neglect to tell them what they are actually working to accomplish. May we, may we remind our students they don't need our permission to explore or to experiment. May we continually seek to be more clear in stating our objectives, both for ourselves and in communicating them to our students. May we keep our eyes on the prize, my friends. It's very intentional work we must do, right? <laughs> and so this is me raising my glass to you. Here, here. That's a wrap on episode 162, friends. Here's hoping that you have some kind of respect left for me after I have confessed so many questionable moments from my past. I want to offer a serious thank you for being the best internet teacher friends a girl could ask for. If you would like to hang out in real time this week or catch a replay of what is sure to be a terrific teacher chat, make sure you check out the Patreon community where $6 buys you entry to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Check out the show notes for today's episode or go straight to christinafwhitlock.com slash Patreon. Until next week, friends. Onward and upward toward stating all of those, quote, obvious things. <laughs>